if you've watched our channel for very long, you know that Randy and I consistently spray the garden for pests and for fungal issues. We spray for pests usually on the weekend using pure neem oil. This is the brand that I like, Dynagrow. Um, we add a little soap to it as a, both a surfactant, <clears throat> which is to help it stick to the leaves, but also uh, it helps as an emulsifier to help mix the oil with the water. And what I use is Sal Suds, Dr. Bronner's Sal Suds. You know, in all the years past, we've always called it Sal Sud Soap. Well, it's really not called Sal Sud Soap. It is called a biodegradable cleaner. There's been arguments all over uh, social media that this is a detergent, that it's not any different than Dawn dish soap. It is very different than Dawn dish soap. I will never use Dawn dish soap. Dawn dish soap takes uh, grease away. Um, remember in the oil spills, how they use Dawn dish soap to clean the animals that were covered in oil. Dawn dish soap in high concentrations uh, or continued use can kill your plants. Pause here for an additional comment uh, or two. All plant leaves have a protective waxy coating. So using a detergent like Dawn dish soap at too great a strength and or too frequently can strip off the leaves protection leaving them way more susceptible to pests and disease pathogens. And another thing about soap, Dr. Bronner's does make a sal sud soap, but it's a Castile soap. You don't want to use that either because Castile soap can react with the minerals in the water source, which leaves a film, or we often refer to it as soap scum. Well, that could plug the stomata or the pores on the back of the leaves. So that is why Dr. Bronner's Sal Sud Biodegradable, ooh, say that real fast, Biodegradable Cleaner is the only one I use. I'm not going to get into an argument about Dawn dish soap or Sal Suds, but I'm going to tell you, this is all I use ever. And additionally, in the neem mixture, I like to add a product called Rid Bugs. This is a really old bottle. And I'm not sure it's even got active ingredients any, anymore. Uh, but I like to add the rid bugs because it will kill the eggs um, of bugs that the neem oil will not kill. I'm not even sure if they make this anymore. I will have to check. But it's another good addition, really stinky, to add to your neem and salsa soap mixture for pests. For fungicides, this has been a huge discussion on my group page because for years we recommended Actinovate and it is a superior fungicidal product. But a couple of years ago, maybe a year and a half, they stopped making it in the two ounce packages. You can only get it in the larger packages, which costs like $130 or more. The downside to that is that Actinovate only is supposed to be good for a year after the date on the package. So it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to spend that kind of money because you only use a teaspoon in a gallon. You're never gonna use up that bigger packaging unless you have just a huge garden and you grow in the spring, the summer, and the fall. You might use it up by then, but it's just a really expensive product to have for just home gardening. So we've been searching for other alternatives that might work. Um, a couple of years ago, I was sent a couple of these bottles, which is the amazing Dr. Zymes Eliminator. It's supposed to work on some pests and then also on uh, fungal issues. I haven't tried it yet, 
There are some precautions about using this and they say to test it on a plant before you go spraying all your plants. That's, I don't know, that's kind of a red flag to me, but um, I just haven't tried it yet. The latest thing, oh, I also have this, which is uh, actually from the same company that makes Actinovate. This is called Companion. And it also is a biological fungicide. Uh, it's open, so I have used it before. This is a new one that someone in my gardening group, Nancy Jacoy, um, shout out to her, that great gardener, has beautiful gardens that she started using. And it is Monterey's Complete Disease Control. If I'm not mistaken, I think she started using it last year, and she really liked it. So I ordered me some, and this is probably what I'm going to be using. Now, when I do a fungicidal spray, I also mix a little bit of soap with it um, to help it, again, stick to the leaves. Because I'm using soap... Um, and soap can, you know, kill pests to smother them. Pause here because someone will say that soap doesn't smother them, and that's correct. It actually um, dehydrates their bodies, which eventually could kill them. I always wait to spray the fungicide in the evening, as well as for pests. We spray in the evening after the sun goes down. Um, and the bees have left for the day to go to bed. So when I spray fungicide, the other thing I like to do is that's the point in time where I like to prune or remove anything I need to off of the plants. And one of the reasons I like to do that is because with the fungicide already on the plant, on the leaves, I don't have to disinfect my hands between every time I pluck something off or cut something off. So in a few hours, after the sun goes down, we will mix up some of this Monterey and a little bit of sal sud and spray away. And I'll show you a few things that need to be pruned. Normally, we start our spray schedule about two weeks after we have transplanted our plants into the buckets. And we usually start with spraying for bugs. That we should have done that last weekend because I'm already seeing some things. In fact, I'm going to take you over in a little bit and show you a pepper plant. Maybe you can help me figure out what ate this thing. Because I've never, in all the years of gardening, seen this happen with a pepper plant. However, since we're going to have six consecutive days of thunderstorms, we are going to start with the fungicide today. Because usually after rains is when you see... Uh, fungal issues start to develop, especially with heat, you know, high heat and high humidity. Okay, spraying for fungicide. Spraying for fung fungi. I'm using Monterey's Complete Disease Control. We've got a sprayer here filled up with about three-fourths water. Goodness. Can you get that open? Well, while Randy's doing that, I'm going to add Dr. Bronner's Salsa Biodegradable Cleaner, just about five drops. Again, this is just for a surfactant. This is a two gallon sprayer. It's made by Scott's and it is battery operated, which is nice. This is a teaspoon measure we need two teaspoons per gallon so now he can go ahead and where's the lid? Such a container. two gallons where's the lid you said two teaspoons per gallon one teaspoon per gallon it's a okay. two gallon container all right when you're spraying for fungicide just like when you're spraying for bugs you need to not only get all over the tops of the leaves, but you need the underneath side of the leaves, the stems, the mulch, the top of the soil mixture. Uh, 
really love this sprayer. As I had mentioned earlier, I like to do my pruning, removal of things right after the fungicide has been applied. Then I don't have to sterilize my hands or pruners. I am wearing gloves because of this Monterey pro product. Um, I'm going to remove, well, here's a sucker, which is in the elbow, but see how this leaf is touching? Tomatoes are notorious for getting soil borne fungus. I don't want any leaves touching the soil. And eventually as this tomato grows up, um, I will remove everything from about eight to 10 inches um, up from the potting mix. Now let's take a closer look at this here. These are cucumber leaves. Truthfully, I have never had cucumbers that don't end up with some issue, especially going from the bottom up. Could this be fungal? It's possible, but it could also be bug related. But I'm going to remove, pinch off that leaf. I'm going to pinch off any leaves that look bad. I'm gonna pinch off these blooms too. And these as well. Kind of a multi-stem tomato plant here but i'm gonna leave it for now but i'm gonna pop out some of these i'm also going to remove any buds and any suckers at this point in time the plant is not big enough to be flowering and I want it putting its energy into growing taller and not uh, fruit production. Got the same thing going on here with a few of these leaves on this cucumber plant. You don't want to be too aggressive because you got to have leaves for photosynthesis. This one is a melon, um, a cantaloupe. Honestly, it looks pretty good. I'm going to take a couple of these lower leaves off. not quite long enough to get up on my trellis. Now, some people will probably make a comment, oh, you never want to plant cucumbers and melons next to one another because they will cross pollinate. Actually, I've done a whole video about that in the series on, um, let's see, actually it was on companion planting. No, they do not cross pollinate. And I tell you why in that video, so. I'll link it below in case you're interested in watching that. But the downside to planting them together is because they have the same sort of pests. I was running out of room, so I didn't have a lot of choice in where I was going to plant it because I needed trellis. <clears throat> These here are other cucumbers. These are the muncher types. This one's not quite long enough yet to get up here. I can try to maybe wrap gently with one of these little feeders, but sometimes they just break off and you really just need to wait until 
it's long enough to grab and start climbing the trellis. Yeah, that's probably not going to stay. <clears throat> the munchers look pretty good. This one leaf. Actually, I'll take these two off. Got some holes in here, so some some critters been chewing. But overall, it looks pretty good. In, this is another tomato, <clears throat> Cherokee purple, in a five gallon bucket, which is kind of small for a Cherokee purple. So definitely have to keep it pruned. Not time at all to be flowering. All of that, I should have caught that earlier. All of that's coming off. I want growth. Not fruit production right now. Looking for suckers. On these that are in five gallon buckets, I will keep the suckers pruned off. On the ones in the larger buckets, we'll talk about that when we get over there. Some things here I wanted to show you with the striker beans. I typically always have this happen at the first uh, part of growing beans. Now, what is it? Well, <laughs> could be a number of things. This looks a little bit like angular leaf spot. Actually, leaf hoppers can also cause this similar looking damage. But when you look here, same thing, but to me, it looks a little bit more like sun scald. Maybe some of you can comment. It's not on the new growth. We'll just have to keep an eye on it and watch it. Same thing here, could be angular leaf spot. Got some tiny holes, could be a chewer. Definitely a chewer there with a hole. Chewers here with holes. You know, when you're not sure what it is, until you can try to figure out what it is, it's just really important to keep your schedule of spraying for bugs and spraying for fungus. Same few things here. This one especially to me looks like sun scald. And considering the, the temperatures we've had very high humidity and then followed by oh um degrees of less than 60 degrees beans really don't like that and then followed by very high humidity again look at this edge rain um, even with on days where we've had sunshine. So all I do after spraying for fungus is go through and take off leaves that look like they're starting to have a problem. You don't want the plant to be investing energy in trying to repair that. To me, that looks totally like sun scald. Y'all tell me what you think. Talk a little bit about the tomatoes over here in this garden. As I had mentioned earlier, I had bought some tomato plants because I was so late in starting my seedlings 
these are some of my seedlings. And I also mentioned that I had so many tomato plants and nowhere to plant them. So I did decide to plant two tomato plants in these 14 gallon buckets. The minimum for indeterminates, at least the recommended minimum, is seven gallons. So basically that's what where we're at. But I will have to make sure I keep these um, pruned because that's just asking for fungal issues. On these small seedlings, there's really not much to take off. Nothing is touching the ground. These are the cotyledon leaves, which, you know, I can snap them off. Not necessary. They will die on their own. But, you know, that is fine. That's all I need to do. I wanted to mention some other fungicide type products that you can use. Now, we did a very long video back in 2017 on beating back the bugs and fungal stuff. And I will link that in the description box below. I go over all kinds of things that you can use just out of your refrigerator or your pantry to include milk and water, uh, baking soda and water for bugs, just water on something like aphids or um, a little bit of the insecticidal soap. Again, Dr. Bronner's Sal Sud Biodegradable Cleaner and water. So there are several options that you have. But for a stronger fungicide, again, the Monterey is what I'm using, disease prevention. But another one that I have used in the past that I really like is Serenade. I don't have any more of it. I will be ordering it. Now, my friend Penny Borden from my group page, a fantastic gardener, she's always really used Serenade instead of the Actinovate. And she adds the companion product that I talked about. I was remembering that I had used it once. Remember I said it's been opened. Um, but the thing about this is you kind of have to make a slurry with water. And I remember probably not reading the directions very carefully because I reread them. You really need to run it through like a mesh, probably like something like cheesecloth or maybe a little bit holier but you need to catch some of those particles because it really will stop up your sprayer and I remember when we used this Randy was like I don't like that stuff <laughs> it's clogging up the sprayer so serenade and companion would be a good mix it says you can mix the companion with other fungicides but it says to I don't know research it make sure they're mixable so that's why I didn't bother to mix this with the Monterey today. Now, why would you maybe want to use Serenade? Well, again, the person that recommended the Monterey, Nancy Jacoy from my group, said that she was kind of noticing that it worked well on cucurbits, but not so much for tomatoes. And I can't remember if she said anything about the other nightshades like peppers and eggplant. So speaking of peppers... Take a look at this. I have six pepper plants planted in this entire uh, area of the tomatoes. Now, normally, I only plant peppers in the, in the middle row of five-gallon buckets, and I usually always put borage in the two five gallon buckets on the uh, the outside gutters and the reason is I've, I've said many times before i have never had tomato hornworms as long as i plant borage next to my tomatoes this year i did not do it for two reasons number one i started late and borage takes quite a while to get your seeds up to the point of flowering which is you know really when it starts to help with the the tomato hornworms and the other reason, again, is trying to get as much food out of this growing season as possible. But this, guys, I have never, ever seen this. 
every leaf. I think I took those off. But look, all the leaves are chewed, except for the top. Now, normally I would think this is a pretty much of a lost cause, which it still may be, because you have to have leaves for photosynthesis. But I do not know what kind of varmint took all these leaves off. Do we have deer around here? Yes, but they don't usually go for the nightshades. Uh, and we have so many other things in the yard and wooded property that they would go for first before jumping into this fence. I don't think it could be rabbits because we have rabbit wire on our fencing all around the whole gardens. So if you've ever seen this, let me know. Tree rats. That is what I think. I honestly think that squirrels have gotten in here and just rip the leaves off. Why they only did it on the pepper plants, I don't know. Here you don't see any leaves really, but I may have tossed them. But I've got one bucket over there I'm going to show you in a moment. All the leaves are ripped off and they're just laying in the potting mix. What critter would do that? Then I thought, okay, well, is it only sweet peppers? No because this is all a mix. This is a hot banana. I don't think they ate the leaves. They just wanted to destroy my plant. Now I have seen tomato hornworms do this, but if, uh, if it was a tomato hornworm, there's no frass anywhere and none of the tomatoes adjacent to these next to them have been touched. If you've ever seen this, let me know. But I honestly think it's those stupid tree rats. And here's the other pepper plant I wanted to show you. You can see all the leaves stripped off of many of the stems. And then you go down, down, down to the bottom. And there's all the leaves. Something just ripped them off and left them on the potting mix. Let's talk squash vine borer. I have done a ton of videos on the squash vine borer. Now, in the first episode, no, beg your pardon, in this previous episode, I showed you wrapping foil on the uh, summer squash and then the Georgia candy roaster winter squash because they're susceptible to the squash vine borer. You're lucky if you live in a region where you don't get these, but anywhere about uh, east, eastern side of Texas, probably all the way to the east coast, you get the squash vine borer. It comes from a moth, and unlike most moths that fly at night, this one flies during the day. Here's a quick picture of one. And they lay their eggs, usually, uh, well, they can lay them on the leaves or the stem. After they hatch, these little nasty white worms bore into the stems of the squash plant and start eating it, destroying the vascular system in very short order. Now, what will kill these little worms? This. It's BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. It kills caterpillars, gypsy moth, tomato hornworm. Basically, wormy things. That's all it kills. It is not a fungicide. It just kills the worms. Now, it doesn't kill on contact, um, but it will stop them from eating immediately and then they usually die in two or three days. Now, I've heard a lot of people say they just spray their plants, their squash plants with BT. Well, okay, but unless you catch that worm on the outside of your plant before it burrows into the stem, it's a bit of a waste. 
there's a very small window of time when that worm hatches and then starts burrowing in pretty quickly. So just spraying the plant with BT is not going to do very much. So in addition to the foil, trying to protect the base of the stem, I'm going to try something new this year that I've not tried before, but I've heard it used successfully. So we're gonna give that a go as well. The treatment I'm about to show you needs to be done preferably twice a week. If you just can't get to it, do it at least once a week. Now these moths are attracted to the yellow flowers, which you see here. I can remove these because they are done. They're not gonna open up again. By the way, this is, this is a male blossom. Get this one off. Also a male. Well, get it in the, there we go. Also a male. Let me zoom in and I'll show you a couple of close-ups of some females that are starting to develop now. All right, this is a male, hadn't opened up yet. That right there is a female. So is that one. So is that one. This is a male. You can tell the difference because the base of a female squash bloom actually has what looks like a little squash on it. Uh, these are patty pan. That's why they're shaped kind of like a flying saucer there. And once that bloom opens, it's going to require a bee or me to take an open male blossom very early in the morning and pollinate it. I have another video where I showed you how to hand pollinate squash. But back to the vine borer. So here is your main stem coming up. This stem is rather solid. All of these leaves on the side, actually I'll take this one off because it's got some sunburn on it. Let's see if I can, can you see that the side leaves are hollow? Perfect place for those little worms to get in there, although they definitely get in the main stem too and eat away. So how do we get the BT inside the stem where the little worm is going. Well, you do that with a syringe. You can get syringes at Tractor Supply, which again, Nancy Jacoy reminded me of when we were talking about this on my group page, I believe today, in fact. Um, we didn't get ours there. But anyway, it's just a basic syringe. So we're gonna mix up some BT and talk about how to inject the BT into the stem. You're going to want to inject it into the main stem and then you're also going to want to inject it into these peripheral leaves coming off. Now this plant is really pretty young yet for me to start seeing moths that turn into the squash vine borer, they're pretty little, but I wanted to go ahead and kind of show you. BT, uh, if you read the directions, it basically says like anywhere from a teaspoon and a half up to four teaspoons per gallon. Honestly, I don't think a teaspoon and a half in a gallon of water is gonna do you very much good. So when I spray things with a sprayer using BT, I always go three to four teaspoons per gallon. So I'm not necessarily gonna measure. I have just a small pint container here with very little water in it because I'm not doing all my squash plants. I'm just gonna show you. So I've had this stuff quite a while. It lasts forever. Just a teeny tiny splash in this small amount of water will be fine. 
and when when I go to really do this once a week when my squash plants are bigger I'll probably use a quart jar and of course apply a little bit bigger splash so just mix it up as you can see I got mine from Jeffers which is kind of a pet farm implement place anyway give it a little squirt now on the main stem, you're going to want to inject it about every three inches. If you have squash vine bores, you're gonna to wanna to do it even closer together. But basically just push in and squirt. It's gonna be a little bit harder to do in the main stem because the main stem is solid. Push in, push several cc's in. Push in, push several cc's in. You can go up as far as you want to go. Now, on the big leaves, the offshoots, All you need to do is come up about six inches. This is going to go in much easier because it is hollow. And then just push several cc's in it and it's gonna flow down. So if you had a vine borer down in here, it's going to get there and kill it. The reason to do it at twice a week is because these little varmints will hatch and get in there. And they can live, I think, for about 12 days inside your plant. So the more diligent you are with doing this, the more likely you are to actually harvest some squash. Now with the excess, yeah, with the excess, go ahead and water it in won't hurt anything. You're looking at all the plants. And look at all the tadpoles. Yeah. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, look at the fish. Look at the little frogs. Come look, see. see tadpoles. Little, see the tadpoles swimming. Tadpole. See right here? Uh, yeah. Yeah. 